Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. So as many of you know, I did an awesome summit a couple years ago called the Women's Empowerment Summit, Rise Up and Kick Ass. And since that summit, I have been on the search for people who can inspire women. And you might think, well, what does inspiration and rising up have to do with weight loss? Well, I'll tell you, it has everything to do with weight loss because If you're not empowered, if you're not inspired, if you're not living the life you're supposed to be living and living your true self, it doesn't matter how many supplements you take, how many diets you try, if you're missing that piece, which is ultimately that's happiness, it's fulfillment in life, it will be very challenging for you to get the weight off. You may get it off, but to keep it off will be a whole nother story because you're not happy with who you are, where you are in your life. So when I came across my next guest, I knew I had to have him on the show. He is like the epitome of inspiring women. (laughs) Inspiration, let's just say that. David Trotter is a transformation coach and author of Empowered to Rise, The Secret to Embracing Your True Identity, Uncovering Your Superpowers, and Bringing Inspiration to the World. He is the host of Inspiration Rising, a podcast dedicated to inspiring women to rise up in life, love, and leadership. Through his launch, Launch Your Life online course and coaching experience, he helps women and men overcome painful life transitions, divorce, empty nest, job dissatisfaction, and develop a workable plan to make lasting changes. For over 25 years, he's helped people get unstuck, clarify their goals, and take their lives to the next level through his leadership, speaking, books, and filmmaking. You can find him at inspiring, oh, inspo, rising.com. <laughs> I will put that in the show notes, but it's insporising.com. So welcome, David Trotter. Thank you so much, Karen. It's great to be with you. Yes, it's great to be with you. He's wearing his plaid shirt just for me. So you, so those of you that are listening to the podcast, you have to go onto the YouTube channel and just check out his handsome plaid shirt that he's wearing for me because he heard that I live up in the mountains and wanted to, right? You wanted to appease me, Dave? Yeah, and you know what? Ironically, on this video, you look so much tanner than I am. (laughs) You're right, I do. It's also really hot in here. No, I would never. No. (laughs) Look at my gorgeous skin. I wouldn't look like this at 43 if I went to a tanning bed. No, yeah. You know what? It's hot in my office, so I'll give it that. I've got my windows open, even though it's like minus 10 right now, because I work in an old building with those old water heaters, and it's like a sauna in here, so... I'm okay. freezing in my office. I think it's like 65 oh, in here. Poor so. you and down in California. So Dave, you have an amazing story. Like you came from this very religious background. That's how you were raised. And you were raised in an environment where women were considered less than. And so can you tell us a little bit of how you transitioned into having this be a focus to help women rise up? Yeah. You know, I don't necessarily know if I'd feel comfortable with the term less than, but it does. um, It is hard because that's what ends up uh, feeling like for many women, because, you know, in the conservative Christian world that I was raised in, um, women were definitely seen as equal in value, but different in role. And what happens in when um, someone is said, well, you can't be in a certain role, then it feels like in some way, I am less than. You're telling me I have equal value, but in some way it doesn't feel that way when I'm not allowed to play a certain role. And in, and if your listeners have any um, connection with the Christian faith in terms of religious tradition, mm-hmm. um, many of those would not allow women to have certain roles in the church. Couldn't be a pastor. Couldn't teach men. Um, couldn't be an elder. You know, kind of in a leadership position. And so. Um, yeah, I, I did go through that journey and I was a part of churches like that. I was a pastor for over 10 years in the context where I was pastoring. Um, in one context, women were not allowed to be a pastor. And then when I became a pastor myself, meaning uh, the lead pastor, uh, I had a female pastors on my staff and uh, that were leaders in our church. And um, for me, it just felt like a natural transition. Women have always played a powerful role in my life. And I enjoy working with women. I didn't feel the need for my leadership to just be men. We needed the perspective of everyone 
uh, in our church. And so now, you know, I haven't been in full-time ministry for about 11 years now. And when I started Inspiration Rising, the podcast back in January, 2019, I asked my wife, I said, who should be the target audience? You know, who should be the people that I go after? And we both agreed that the group of people that most re have resonated with my work for the past 25 years, whether it's been ministry, filmmaking books, has been women. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, it's weird. It's not like I'm going after that. And, um, you know, I tell my wife, I go, well, it's not because I'm so hot. And I go, maybe it's because I'm gay. <laughs> maybe I'm gay. Maybe that's why women are attracted. To me. No, I'm not gay. I'm not, I'm not hot and I'm not gay, but I don't know. I just care about people. And I don't know. You look um, pretty good in your plaid, Dave. You. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah. It's been an interesting journey for sure. It is odd. Yeah. I don't know of a lot of men that are focused on helping women in the personal development world. Not that yeah. I don't work with men as well, yeah. but it does seem a little bit unique. Would you say it was a calling from God? Like, did you feel like this, like that the spirit moved you, that your religion had a part of it? Gosh, I don't know. I, I, I think that would be overstating it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that might have been the case, but it just is a bit more subtle. I don't feel this strong, you know, calling. I just feel like when I'm talking with women, when I'm working with women, it just feels supernatural. It feels mm -hmm. easy. It flows. It's fun. It's playful. It's inspiring. Um, so I just, I just enjoy it. And you know, so much has happened recently in the last couple of years with the Me Too movement yeah. and um, this, you know, aggressive desire to help women find equality, not only in pay, but in the workplace and all of these things. And I don't have that energy inside of me. Like, I don't have that aggressive, like, women need to, you know, da 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 and I've even thought, maybe I need to amp that up inside of me. Maybe I need to find that, you know, and kind of, but I go, that's just not me. Like, I just mm -hmm. feel like I'm with people. I want to help people. And part of that does mean um, addressing things that are rooted in the Me Too movement. It also means addressing things regarding equality or pay. But that's not the passion behind it. It's more just, I just enjoy helping people. I enjoy helping them get clear about their life and take ground. And it seems over the last 25 years to resonate with women. So that's kind of where I've landed. Because I would have to say it is that we're, we, we are and were, especially back then, considered less than. I do think that because maybe our roles were somewhat, in, in a lot of families, maybe that role of mothering and taking care of the home was respected by their partner. But I think in general, we weren't. I think in general, if a man took that part, they were considered stepping down a notch. That's true. That they weren't that in true. power, right? That's like, true. So I yeah. think, but I agree. Like, I don't, I, I feel for myself even, who's been through a lot of stuff as far as that went, I don't feel the anger either. I, I don't at all. Like, I don't feel like, rah, rah, yeah, woman. Even though I did the Women's Empowerment Summit. And it's more just about trying, I really want us to find balance. Because I, I feel like we had to come so far the other way with the rah, rah, rah and the anger in order to get some more equality. But now we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit because now we're trying to take on all roles mm. and that balance has to be found. So I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think you're not feminist enough. I think that's yeah. a little, yeah. You know. <laughs> it, it, is, it is hard. It is hard. And I'm not anti, you know you know, people getting fired up about those things because everybody has a season of life. Everybody has a passion and calling. It's all good. Um, yeah. uh, but um, I just find that mine comes from a bit more of a um, place of peace, a place of connection. Um, but I do hear what you're saying, that there has been such a desire to have a uh, commanding role, a leadership role in the kind of the day-to-day -day workplace um, that then that that impacts women in terms of what they're doing at home. I think as you and I had talked about on uh, when I interviewed for my, you for my podcast, I think the um, the challenge is, is that women are taking the majority of the responsibility and leadership in the home, um, meaning the the work. You know what I mean in terms mm -hmm. of like day to day mm -hmm. work. And I you know I, I, that's hard because now you've got two full time jobs basically. Yeah. And you talk a lot about finding purpose. Like you said, like that's a big part of what you talk about for women to help women, which is 
to help them find their purpose. And I think that gets very blurred. Like you said, we're taking on all of these roles. So how, how does a woman even start to think like, what is my purpose? Because right now we think our purpose is to mother the children, clean the house, cook the dinner, go to, ch- to our job nine to five. So how does somebody kind of take a step back and go, okay, actually, what is my purpose here? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't use the word purpose a lot. I use more um, what someone's passion, probably what's kind of right. inside of them. Yeah. And because I also see that our passions change over the course of our life. So um, I don't think we have one purpose over the course. There might be one thread that we see interweaving in the things that we're interested in. But, you know, I have spent uh, years p- pursuing certain passions because it felt like, no, this is what I'm doing in this season of life. So that's what I try to ask women is going in this season of life that you're in right now, or in the season of life that you anticipate coming up, what do you want to see? What do you want to experience? Um, I have a, a five-step process that's basically part of this Launch Your Life course, and it's five questions. It's, it's who am I? What do I want? What truths will keep me focused? How will I take action? And who will walk with me? And so when we go through the coaching process, the first is who am I? Because so many uh, women wrestle with identity because the identity has changed. Many of the women that I work with, they're in transition of identity. So they're coming out of a divorce, out of separation. And it's like, well, who am I when I'm not married or with this person? Um, A lot of the women that I work with have kids that are going to middle school. And now they're not as needed because in the elementary years, if they are a stay-at-home mom, they're doing a lot more. And now the kids going to middle school, it's like, well, who am I now? Like, what am I, what am I doing with my time? Especially when a child goes off to college. My daughter's mm-hmm. just started college. It's changed our whole family dynamic. But it also changes your, as a woman, many times your identity because you're going, who am I now? So uh, what I try to help women do is root their identity, not in the things that they're doing, but in um, things that are unchanging over the course of their life. Um, because I have a spiritual background, we talk about um, their divine imprint, that if there is a divine being that created us, and I believe that div- divine being is made, um, is embodies love, in the same way that um, if I'm handcrafting an item, my fingerprints, my heart is in that item. I've created something because it's flowing from me. And so I believe that when it comes to the divine, that there, we all have a divine imprint inside of us. And that is, um, you know, that, that is showing who we are and we've got to get in touch with that in order to know that, that, that our identity flows from more than just what we do, more than just our relationships, but there's something deep, deep down inside of us that roots um, our identity. And, and that's where we start. So what was the next one? Can I, can we hear a couple more of those just so yeah. that people can kind of take, like get, use it as a tool? Absolutely. So who am I? And so really more than the divine imprint, I also take people through their strengths. And um, we look at the tool by Gallup, the strength finders um, assessment, um, because people's strengths are really their strengths oftentimes over the course of their entire life. And we can create an identity around those strengths that's powerful because those are not going to change. You know, we're in a relationship one day, we're out, that's okay, but our strengths stay the same. Our personality, we look at that, our wiring, and then our life story. So those four things um, develop the foundation of launching your life. I use the, the um, uh, metaphor of the space shuttle. Um, you're old enough to remember the United States space shuttle, right? Yeah. Maybe yeah. you watched that takeoff. Um, and so you don't launch a rocket or a space shuttle off of a platform of dirt or wood it's got to be a strong solid foundation in order to launch your life and that's why we say in order to take your life to the next level you've got to have a strong foundation and that foundation is always your identity who you are Um, and if you don't know who you are um, most likely you are going to self-identify with things that are going to prop you up if you're not confident in that identity, you're probably going to prop yourself up with either your education, your job title, your house, your clothes, or your um, car, or even your kids. Like so many people find identity in, well, this is who my kids are, and this is how they excel in sports or, you know, all that stuff. So 
um, our identity is so key that we, that, oh, yeah, okay, that's all part of our life, but that's not our identity. That's not going to be our identity moving forward. Uh, your weight, the size of your body, um, and the weight that shows up on the scale, that's not your identity. Right. You know, that's okay. That's a part of your life. That's fine. Yeah. But that's not who you are deep down. And so uh, the second part is what do I want? So uh, who am I and what do I want? And so I go, okay, if you're on the launch pad as a, you know, metaphorical rocket, where are you going? You're not going to just shoot off into space. You've got to have a clear path of like, okay, that's the, I, we talk about it as a vision, a mental picture of your preferable future. So what is that vision? Um, and, and I say, it does, it's not the vision for your whole life. It's just a vision for like the next six to 12 months. What do you accomplish? What do you want to experience? And so I say, give me a snapshot in time. And what's funny is many of the women who go through my program, they begin by thinking, oh, I'm going to start this side hustle, or I'm going to start this business, or I'm going to get this new job. And they end up going, you know, okay, you know, my vision for the next six to 12 months is I need more fun and creativity in my life. And they're, they're weirded out by that going, yeah, it's just what I, you know, it's what I feel like I'm supposed to do. And then we help develop a path of how to create that because they know if they get more fun and creativity in their life, it's going to um, impact all of their life in a positive way. That's not for everybody. That's just every woman comes up with a different vision. So what mm -hmm. do I want? Uh, the third is what truths will keep me focused. So throughout our journey of accomplishing any vision, there will be lies that come into our head. Some people call them false beliefs. I prefer to call them lies. Um, I believe that there are metaphorical or real dark forces in our world that seek to throw us off our path, that seek to uh, lie, kill, and steal and destroy our life. Um, not just physically, but you know, emotionally mm -hmm. and, and spiritually, psychologically. And so those lies come into our heads all the time without us even asking. Um, so a lie that you... Uh, may have had, um, perhaps, Karen, in the last month would be, I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good spouse. I'm not a good coach. Uh, my, um, my, my plans don't work. I, you know, we think of all these crazy things. It could just come in for a moment. And then, um, so what I teach people is how to combat those lies, to identify it, that it's not just a nebulous negativity in our head. Because anytime you're feeling kind of funky or down, I'd almost guarantee you that you're believing a lie about right. yourself, the world around you. And so if you're feeling funky, you go, okay, don't stay in that world of negative, neg nebulous negativity. Identify the lie, replace it with the truth. So that means I've got to then go, okay, well, what is the truth? And then the third is open up a brief case of evidence. So I take people into the courtroom of their mind. We do this through meditations and visualizations open up a briefcase of all the time. So let's just say, Karen, that you happen to, well, let's just go with a lie. Is there something, a negative uh, thought or lie that you've believed in the last couple of days? Could be anything. Uh, oh gosh, don't put me on the spot like that. My, my, my mind will just go completely blank, but we'll just no, say, no. I'll pick one from my past if yeah, that's yeah, yeah, easier. That yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, had yeah. to get over my limiting beliefs, right? Sure, sure, sure. Um, I've always had limiting beliefs around money. Okay. That, that I'm not like that. I don't suit being a person with wealth and that's not who I am. And, and that, and that I need to struggle in order to make money. And I had to get rid of that a long time ago. Yeah. So um, it could even be that you, um, well, I'll, I'll relate it to me. I mm -hmm. got a bill for $1,850 the other day for something that um, it was something that I had, uh, it was actually bookkeeping that had mm -hmm. mounted over the course of months. And uh, I was like, Oh, man, that's a lot of money. And so um, I could have the thought of, uh, I'll like, here's one, a lot of people believe I'll never get ahead. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I'll never get ahead. Okay, great. So that's a lie. And so the truth is that I get to believe the truth is that I have access to all the resources I need in order to fulfill the inspiration that, that I have been given. Okay, I have access to all the resources I need. Because if I see that, if that is the truth, then um, I'll attract that. So now, if, okay, I've identified the lie. I've replaced it with the truth. Now I'm going to open up a brief case of evidence. So um, when in your life, Karen, have you had uh, resources flow to you that have just flow, that you didn't even realize, right? It, it right. just flows. 
Yeah. So give, give me some examples. Like, um, it just happened recently where, you know, like I, I was kind of a little bit worried about money and then I was like, and, and I try and I, I'm, I'm really good at like seeing my lies and my limiting beliefs. And I kind of talked myself out of it. And literally within days later, I go into my bank account and there was an extra thousand dollars in there. And I'm like, what is this? And it was ended up, it was an affiliate thing that I have with somebody that sold, I sold one of his programs just by chance and yeah. boom, I had a thousand dollars Canadian in my bank account. I was like, what? Yes. Like it just flowed. And then I'm not kidding you, Dave. A month later, I had sent, my mom had found a tax error from two years ago that she did on my taxes. And we had sent it in and I had forgotten about it. And then boom, it came back. And we didn't know how much it was going to come back to me, but it was like $1,500 back, back pay. And then another two weeks later, I got back pay for child taxes. And it was another like $600. And this was all within a month. I was like, wow, I am on fire right now. Yes. <laughs> and yet you didn't do anything. No. Right? Other than, you, you know, you, you identified the lie and chose to believe the truth. Um, so, so all of that is evidence now that you have in your briefcase that when that lie comes up again, you can't, hey, I want to clarify, that's not my dog. That's no, your dog. No, it's not. It's out on and, the street, like in the yeah. office area. I don't know where I don't, it's coming I don't want I don't want to get blamed for that, okay? okay. <laughs> I'll close my door if it keeps going. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, um, you know, now you have all this evidence that you can turn to the next time when that lie comes up, right? Yes, yes. So for me, um, I had, uh, beyond Inspiration Rising, I do marketing for clients and other things, just like you, you know, right? There's my, I get involved in all kinds of things. And I had a client come to me with a new project. I was like, oh, that was unexpected. Then I had a buddy who contacted me and he said, hey, I'm doing a uh, online advertisement for Epson printers. Um, I'd like you to be the, the, the model for that, like this, the, the person. It's, an, it's no speaking role. I don't even understand that. I'm like, oh my gosh. He goes, it's like 500 bucks for the day and like I'll probably get you another 250 if you bring props and that kind of thing. Karen, what the heck? Where did that come from? I have no idea. So anyway, uh, I now have, I have that as a brief case of evidence. And then the fourth step for me is that I anticipate a positive outcome because I can, if I go through that process and I'm still anticipating like, eh, and I'm worrying, it, it just won't flow, right? So identify the lie, replace it with the truth, um, open up briefcase of evidence, and then uh, anticipate a positive outcome. So I teach people how to focus on those truths because when we have a vision in our mind, something that we want to accomplish in the next six to 12 months, those lies will come. And we've got to be able to address those because if we don't, we'll then move toward procrastination. We won't um, take action. We'll become worried, you know, all of that stuff. Um, the fourth part of the Launch Your Life program is uh, how will I take action? So this is now that you have a clear vision, what are the goals that will, if you accomplish those goals, will allow you to experience that vision? And then we develop action steps. And, you know, I think it's crazy because, Karen, my mind just thinks this way. I mean, I coach people. We get on the phone and they're like, uh, I just don't know what a goal would be to do that. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, uh, you know, one, two, three. They're like, holy cow, how did you even think that? I go, I don't know. I just, it just part of me. It's no big deal. And, but here's the funny thing. We don't accomplish stuff unless we set goals. Like it just doesn't have, it sounds so elementary, but people don't accomplish things unless they have a vision, set the goal to reach the vision and then develop action steps and put a plan in place. And uh, for whatever reason, that's my superpower. And I help people, you know, get things done uh, in their life. And people come to our program, and they want to do all sorts of things. Like, it doesn't matter. I'm no expert on relationships. I'm no expert right. on, you know, weight loss. But rock, it's the same uh, formula. It's the same formula for all that. Totally. Yeah. The fifth step is so important, and it's who will walk with me. Oh, but I you can that. never do it alone. Anytime I've accomplished anything great in my life, it's always been with other people. Usually, there's uh, one or two people that are my cheerleaders. They're not technically savvy with whatever I'm trying to do. Right. They're like my wife. It's just like, you can do it. I believe in you, but go for it. You know, and she'll listen to all the technicalities, but she's not going to give me advice on that because she doesn't know, you know. Uh, but then there's also a technical person who may not be very nice, 
you know, they're not my cheerleader, but they're like, okay, here's the steps. One, two, three, da, da, da. They're like, oh, great. That saved me time. Thank you so much. Right. Who will walk with you? With you. Yeah. I love so. that. Who will yeah. walk with you? That's great. Who will walk with you in this journey? Well, I will relate it to weight loss because I use a very similar formula. And I tell women all the time, like, first of all, where are you going? You, you don't know, if you don't have the vision, how are you going to get there if you don't know where you're going, right? And just having that vision, most women can't even go beyond that, that day, that moment of I'm overweight. They can't yeah. see themselves. And I say, well, what does it look like without the weight? What are you doing differently? What What's your relationship? Like? Yeah, totally. What's your relationship like? How is that affecting your children? And I'd say 95% of women have never thought that. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. And so it's just yeah. focused on, this is what I look like now. This is yeah. the weight. This Got to do the diet. Got to lose. Got to lose the weight. Yeah. So it's, much uh, stress, anxiety, and grasping. Totally. It's totally. the grasping. Yeah. yeah. And when you talk about identity, I think about how many women are really attached to their weight because that is, to them, that's who they are. And so when I say, who are you without the weight? I said, like, you know, how often do you think of your weight? I'll ask a woman that. And she'll say, oh, you know, 80% of my thoughts are about my body and my body image wow. and what I'm eating and trying to resist food. And I'm like, where are your thoughts when you don't have that anymore? And it actually makes them panic a little bit. And I've seen women self-sabotage their weight loss because they can't identify with that person. It's not who they are. And it freaks them out. And they're like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, I don't even know who this is or how to be that person. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then when you say, I'm just going to, I like picking this apart a little bit because yeah, you say, yeah. um, take action. And I think that that's a really missing piece in a lot of self-help stuff. Like what you hear so much of right now is, um, we have the vision to have the positive attitude, manifestation, affirmation. Mm -hmm. And so people think that all they have to do is sit around and journal about it and have their dream board. Up, mm -hmm. And all of these things are going to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And the action part is the freakiest part. If you yeah. ask me, that for me is always the scary part where I'll be like, mm -hmm. Oh my God, look at how many self-help books I've just read. And have I done anything? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And I think, we get frozen. We get frozen with fear and to not take the action. And I think you're right just to, even if it's just a baby step, like you said, maybe it's just to have more creativity for the six, next six months. Like, mm -hmm. what does that look like? What can you do? Right. And I think that that's such an important piece of the puzzle for sure. Mm -hmm. And yes, community. One of the things that um, I'm always challenging people with is that uh, this is the very first week of our course where I say, write yourself a permission slip. Write yourself a permission slip to do whatever you want. Um, and we go back to, you know, as a little kid, you had to have permission slips um, to, I don't know, maybe in Canada, they let you guys run loose, but we had to have permission slips. Uh, we had to have them too. I faked a lot of mine. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding <laughs> no, me? No, don't tell the, the pastor. Don't tell. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and you're always worried if you don't have a permission slip, you can't go. Well, so many people in life go, well, I need permission to do this thing, whatever it is. Yeah. And I go back to uh, the films that I've made on social justice issues and tell people, yeah, I, I didn't go to film school. You know, nobody, nobody asked me to make a film. I made a film because I wanted to make a film. Well, how'd you do it? Figured it out. You just figure, you figure it out. If you're really, if you have the vision, if you have that mental picture of the preferable future that you want and it's strong and it's rooted in you and you feel it, you will figure out a way 100%. to make it happen. Yeah. But you've yeah. got to have that vision. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I, uh, people are, uh, want to write a book. They want to um, start a side hustle. They want to get a new job. It's like, well, uh, who, uh, should I, is, is that, you know, can I, will, I? no, your parents, forget your parents, like do what you want, do it, yeah. go, yeah. you know? And once again, you can find proof of that when you look back in your life. Like I remember being a single mother, I had, you know, no money at all. And I was like, that's it. I want to buy a house. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to buy a house. <laughs> and I did. I ended up really? buying it. <laughs> that is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. People, you don't need permission. And I mean, if there's some legal thing, you want to be a massage therapist or a doctor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You need permission. But for most things, you don't. You can just do it.
Yeah, you do. Yeah. I love it. Now you had a bit of a breaking point in your own life where things came to a head and it's a pretty intense story. So can you share it? Karen, why do you bring this up? This is so embarrassing. No, it's oh gosh. not. Okay. It's not. Uh, yeah. I was for over 10 years, a workaholic for sure. Yeah. As a pastor, I was working 60, 70, 80 hours a week for 10 years straight. It was intense. And unfortunately I neglected my family during that time. And I'd rather be working than being with my kids or my wife. And um, uh, about 11 years ago, uh, 2008, I just hit rock bottom. I really did. Um, I made some poor decisions when it came to our marriage. Um, we ended up uh, separating, we're heading for a divorce. And um, after uh, I actually checked myself into a mental hospital, um, it, it just rock bottom. Like I wanted to end my life because I had thrown away everything that I had uh, worked toward. And um, the only thing that prevented me from ending my life was that I didn't want my kids to grow up with a, uh, a loss of their father via suicide. Like I didn't uh, want that to be in yeah, their life. Yeah. And that's what prevented me. It really was. Um, so I did, I checked myself into a hospital for three days and you know, half the people in there were professionals like me. I was rooming with a doctor. Um, the other half are probably still there, you know, yeah. uh, a lot of challenges, but, um, uh, I got stabilized and through the help of a therapist and several close friends really got, I, I had to relaunch my life. And that's really how I even developed the launch your life program or framework was because I had to start over from the ground up. And I was like, this is the way that I did it. And, you know, I enjoy helping others do that mm -hmm. and prevent them from hitting rock bottom. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't talk about their rock bottom experiences, but no. Uh, yeah. A lot of people have them. A yeah. lot of people have them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and my wife and I um, reconciled after six months, and we've now been wow. married over 25 years. And yeah. Um, yeah, now I love spending time with my family. I'm not a workaholic. Um, I love to accomplish things. I love to work, but um, yeah, it's a, it was a. Very Does the depression good. ever sneak back in? Like, do you feel like you're sensitive to that side? Yeah, I actually have been on um, medication for depression and anxiety for 11 years. Mm -hmm. um, I went through uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, his um, brain scan. He has a book called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. Um, you may have seen him on PBS as you're flipping through channels or whatever. And um, they actually measure the activity level in your brain. And so they found that um, basically it's a, a zero to four scale, I believe, zero being normative plus four being very overactive and then negative four being underactive. Wow. And so uh, my basal ganglia came out as a plus four and my cingulate was a plus two. Um, so basal ganglia is your um, fight or flight area. Um, and then cingulate is your kind of gear shifter um, the ability to focus on things. And then my prefrontal cortex was at a negative two. And that's your kind of decision-making and executive uh, thought process. And so, you know, as the uh, psychologist, uh, psychiatrist is reading it, he's like, wow, your brain is completely wired for a, an entrepreneur. Like you are so intense in your reactions. You're so focused. You can focus intensely. Um, he goes, but the challenge is your brain is also wired to destroy relationships because, wow. of, you know, so, um, and the negative two on the uh, the prefrontal cortex, and I this is very personal, obviously. Yes. But um, my wife will ask me, um, "Is that helpful?" Because sometimes my brain, I think things are funny or unique, or this would be interesting, and she'll literally go, "Is that helpful?" And I'll be like, "Yeah, yeah, probably not. Yeah, it's probably not good, you know, to say that or do that or whatever." Um, and the basal ganglia is the fight or flight, so pre being on some anti-anxiety meds, my anxiety didn't focus in on like, uh, uh, like social situations. I funneled my anxiety through work. So I wouldn't be able to have a conversation with you like this. I could, but in the back of my head, right. I'd be thinking about my to-do list, you know, just always going through, what do I need to do next? I couldn't be present with someone. I couldn't be present with my wife. I couldn't be present with my kids. Cause I'd always be thinking about the things that I needed to do. 
got on some meds, slowed my brain down, and it allows me to just be present with people. And yet I can still leverage that to, um, you know, be very focused. I'm a, I can be a very focused person. Mm -hmm. um, so that was very helpful. Um, yeah. My wife said I can never go off those meds. I'm not allowed. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for sharing that. That's being vulnerable and I really appreciate it because I know that one of the number one symptoms, like when I ask women how they're feeling, you know, the number one is depression and anxiety that I get as far as health symptoms go. Uh, like across the board, it's very sad. I would say like 80%, 85% of my clients suffer with depression and anxiety. And I think a lot of women listening to this, hearing your, your kind of the steps to your program, maybe thinking like, oh, easier said than done, or what if you're suffering with depression, or, you know, my life is this, and they start to kind of pick their life apart and saying, well, I can't do that because I have no money, because I have this, because I can't do that, when you were at a very rock bottom, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty bad that you were, that's as low as you can go, I think, is wanting to commit suicide, I do. Yes, yeah. that's, that's tough, you know, and so the fact that you pulled out of it, and we're able to, to then help others with it because as we all know, when you're that low, you're not wanting to be positive, <laughs> yeah. right? You're not wanting well, to. Well, and I had spent the previous 10 plus years helping people, right? right? Helping them get clear on their life. And you can be helping people and in the process, destroying your own life yeah. because of the overworking, right? So... Uh, and that overworking flows from a need to fill a hole in your ego. So for me, I've always struggled with my two primary lies that I wrestle with in life are um, I'll never be enough and yeah. that people don't like me or want to be with me. So I graduated college with a BA and MA on the same day. I walked across the line. I did it in four years. I was so burned out that I didn't finish my thesis for my master's degree. So wow. my, sen my senior year of college, I was finishing a master's. I was married because we got married between my junior year and senior year. And I was working for Nabisco part-time. I was the photographer for our yearbook and newspaper at the college. And I was a TA for a professor. That was all during my senior year. I just like too much. Way right? too much. Yeah. yeah. And that's because I'm trying to fill something in my ego. Well, once I hit rock bottom, I'm like, okay, all right, this is not working. Is this working for me? No, this is not working. So um, the last 11 years, I have not kind of um, focused on building my own thing. I've, I've come alongside other people and helped them build their things. And that's what I love about the Inspiration Rising podcast and the Launch Your Life program is it's about the people that I'm talking to. I'm raising them up. I'm helping other people find out what's ex you know, exciting about them. I love promoting other people. And for me, that, you know, it's fun in the process. But people don't talk about their rock bottom experiences. But that's the, that ultimately, unless you take care of yourself, physically, mentally, spiritually, that is possible. It's possible for all of us. Mm -hmm. So I had uh, $3,000, my car, and a, and a credit card that had a $33,000 limit on it with nothing on it. And so uh, for six months, I had, to, yeah, I had to survive on, you know, because I had nothing. And uh, ultimately, I ended up, that credit card got maxed. And, um, uh, but I didn't want to bankrupt it. And so I, I paid that off. I uh, paid every cent back on that credit card. Um, and everybody has their own journey. But for me, that was part of the restoration of my life was going, okay, I use this money in order to survive. I'm going to pay it back. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I was able to do that, you know, shortly after. So, mm -hmm. and I, I believe, and I'm sure that you looking back on your, your story, I have a, a, a story too, where I, you know, I was on the kitchen floor, you know, at my rock bottom, knowing that I had to, <laughs> I had I to change this. something. Come on, come on, tell me the story. <laughs> Well, same thing. And what I was going to say was there were so many signs leading up to it. It was like God or your, the higher source, whatever you want to call it, was trying to warn me. And this has happened a few times in my life. And I think it happens to everybody that if you don't listen, A, it'll show up in your health, right? You'll put on weight, you'll have chronic disease, you'll get cancer, you get diabetes, like whatever it is, you develop an illness inside the body. and it's like somebody's trying to tell you something. And if you're not listening, you're not living the path, you're not on the path that you're supposed to be on, 
things start happening because you're not listening. It's like life is trying to get your attention. God is trying to get your attention. And I'm sure that there is many, like you didn't just one day wake up and decide I'm going to commit suicide. Oh, no. Correct? No. Oh, no. It led up to that. There was things that led up to it where you were getting the signs like, hey, bud, you need to slow down. This isn't right. This isn't good for you. And you just keep shoving it aside because you don't know how to change it until no. it's so bad that you go, okay, it's, I commit suicide and my kids have to live with the fact that their dad did this or I got to change something. Sure. And that's big. Yeah. And you know, the thing that prevented me it, from getting the help was I was stuck in um, my current world in my identity and I couldn't figure out a way to get out. So if you're a, uh, I was a pastor that had cast a big vision. The church had grown quite large for our area. We had three locations. I had a dozen staff um, and uh, we're doing a 20 minute teaching film that's shown on three screens at three different locations every Sunday. Um, and I don't want to do it anymore. And so wow. if you don't want to do it anymore, then I'm having to wrestle with, wait, was the vision ever real in the first place? Who am I if I don't want to do this anymore? I'm a failure. I'm a failure because I'm not wanting to continue with the vision. And so now if somebody in that same situation came to me, I'd be like, oh, here are the steps that you could take in order to get help and in order to get out and transition. The problem is, is if your ego won't allow you to, because I could have easily said, okay, uh, let's begin some therapy. Let me begin the process of finding a replacement for myself. Let's make a six month transition with the church. Um, and I will, you know, find something else to do with my life. I could have totally done that. Could have totally done that. Yeah. But instead I, you know, hit I just made a, made a mess of my life. Yeah. Yeah. You ignored it. Yeah. When yeah. I, I used to do body work before I was a nutritionist and probably for, for 17 years. And I would say probably for the last five to seven years of it, I so wholeheartedly wanted to be a nutritionist. And I just kept telling myself, nope, there's no money in it. Nobody's going to come to me. I'm not a naturopath. I'm not a doctor. Who's going to pay me? I don't know enough. I don't have enough schooling. Like I had excuse after excuse after excuse. And over that time span, I started developing like severe tendonitis, arthritis. Mm. I was down to like one client every second day because I would, it, one person would hurt my body wow. so much. And I just kept ignoring it, ignoring it. And finally it got so bad. I was like, I have no choice. I got to do this or, right. And I just had to take the plunge. And I was like, okay, I'll go get my certification in nutrition. I don't know what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it. I'm just going to go get it and I'm going to start there. And it was just the first step, right? But it was my body telling me and I ignored it for so long until, mm. and now like I just said yesterday to my husband, I can barely move my hand because it was so cold outside and I've got such bad arthritis in it. And it's like, why didn't I just listen to myself? <laughs> right? Wow. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy what how we will do that and you can see it right in women i'm sure you see it all the time in your students that it's like you just want to pull them out and be like it's okay you, you can do whatever you want actually <laughs> right right but these people are relying on me what are they going to do without me yes yeah yeah you hear there's so many excuses yeah my mom uh she works at a church in an administrative role and um, she was feeling like, oh, my time is kind of done with this. I want to move on to do something else. And she um, was wrestling with setting an end date because they had not found a replacement yet. And uh, I said, well, two things. One, when you set an end date for an employer, oftentimes they're way more motivated to find a replacement. And then secondly, if you don't transition out, you're actually preventing someone else from getting the opportunity to do what they want to do or need to do in their life because there's somebody who desperately wants that job of what you're doing. And until you leave, they can't have it. And uh, that's the same thing when we think about things in our lives, whether it's us um, as a woman stopping doing something in the household, say, right. well, actually, it would benefit your spouse or kids for you to stop. They may feel the pain in the beginning of like, well, this is awkward. This is different. But um, you're preventing them from experiencing something super positive by continuing to hold on to it. 
Mm, and I said, that's oh, good. interesting. Really? I never thought of it that, you know, that way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So when is your, you, you hold this program a couple of times a year. How does it work? Yeah. So it's an eight week program yeah. and uh, there are of course video modules and so forth. We do a weekly mastermind video call where we go through the material and people share their own experiences and stories. It's limited to 20 students because I want to know their name. They're not just a number. I want to know their name and I want to know their challenges. I want to help them. And uh, we do uh, several different um, coaching calls during the time where I'm one-on-one -on -one with them. So our next session begins January 15th, 2020. Um, I think it's a good time. It's kind of an awkward time to be offering it during December when people are, you know, focused on gifts and all that kind of stuff. But I just figure January 15th is such a good time. New year, new life, new, new you know, so yeah, it's yes. fun. And yeah. they can, people can check it out at insporising.com slash launch. Um, so yeah. Yes. And I'll have the show, the link in the show notes for anyone that's interested in it. And then you'll hold it again though throughout the year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Several okay. times a year. Several mm -hmm. times a year. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Oh, I love it. I want to take it. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, Especially for the it. new year. I think it's awesome. I know. Uh, yeah. yeah. I had one student. This is, this is crazy. She uh, was a mindset coach for a medical program and she's extremely gifted in what she does, but she felt like her, her, um, her parents actually died a couple of years ago and she was taking care of them. They died a day apart. Um, which was just, uh, just wrecked her. And she'd really turned inward. She was doing a great job at her job, but she felt like there's got to be something more. She ended up taking the course and she kept, caught a vision for a flower farm. And, you know, she's like, well, that's weird. Who farms flowers? That's so like frivolous. Like, what is this? You know, who does this? And, um, but her husband was supportive. And she and her husband have just purchased a seven acre piece of property outside of Portland. And this spring they'll be planting their first acre of dahlias wow. and she's already connecting with people, you know, that could buy them. I mean, she, the things that happened uh, with her, once she committed to it, all these resources started showing up in her life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everybody's got a different vision and I support yeah. them in their vision. And oh, it's just so fun to see people have breakthroughs in their life. And there's something to be said about collective energy. I really believe in collective mm -hmm. energy and the fact that there's only 20 people that people could get to know each other and each other's stories. And you're all mm -hmm. having that same vision for that person. Yep. I believe in the power of that. Like how you said, so choose your, your, what did you say? The, who you walk with? Yeah. Who will walk with you? Who will walk with you? Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, collective yeah. energy. And that's, that's yeah. in your program. That's amazing. Yeah. We yeah. actually have um, people get two or three people together in what we call a cockpit group. Cause it's like you're launching your life. Who's in your cockpit. Right. You know, right. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> and so they're like, on oh, my cockpit group, we started meeting, you know, and they meet on their own during the week, like over, cause people from all over the world take the course. It's so fun. You know, it doesn't have to be limited to North America. We've had people from other places. So yeah. Yeah. And the accountability then too, is there. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. We even let people from Canada in. Oh. Uh, <laughs> even if I'm not wearing my plaid or is that okay? <laughs> and the, you know, what's so great for me is I get to learn from people that are all over the globe. People were teaching yeah. me. I think I was of telling course. you they had snow tires and they replaced their tires in the winter. They changed them. Out. I'm like, what? You change your tires? Yeah. We store them in our garage or somebody else. We pay somebody to store them. Gosh, I never even thought about changing my tires. That's crazy. Yes. And for those that have not listened to it yet, I was on Dave's podcast. You can find it on the Inspiration Rising podcast. And him and I, prior to that, were talking about where I live. And he was just flabbergasted that I had a wood stove and that my husband went out and chopped down trees. And, you know, he's like, wow, your man must be so manly. I told my husband that he laughed so hard. He was like, oh, yeah, I am. I'm like, well, clearly to the, to the Orange County, Californian you are. <laughs> but I love going onto your Instagram and seeing photos of your home. Oh my mm, gosh, your yeah. home is gorgeous. But it I want to see the outside. You need to take a, you know, I need sure. the whole thing. Yeah, sure. Really I'll send smart. it to you. I just took some new ones of the inside because we just renovated it. So I'll send those in some outside. It's so pretty up there right now, but yes, I will. Very fun. All right, Dave. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Karen, you're doing amazing things. Thank you. Yeah. So are you. Yeah, you're really, you really are. So thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here.